Hello, class. Welcome back. This is Professor Watson. Uh, this is a contracts, LGLA 1351. Uh, this is our first recording for uh, Chapter 9. This week, we're going, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, third parties, um, other parties to the contract, um, as well as I think the end of this chapter talks about secured transactions. Um, so if you have uh, um, not done so already, please read the chapter. Uh, if you'd like to, you can review my lecture notes. Uh, those are also in your materials. Um, otherwise, let's get started on Chapter 9. Um, Let's see here. So the original parties to the contract, right? The, the offeror and the acceptor, right? Uh, the original parties to a contract always have rights. Remember, um, we've talked about uh, consideration and mutuality, that, that, that consideration is what you give for what you get, that mutuality means both parties have to give something and they both have to get something. And so uh, the original parties to a contract, they always have rights, right? They can always sue to enforce the contract. Uh, they also always have obligations, right? There's something that each side has to give up. Each side, it's something that each side has to do. Um, if you have three or four or more parties to the contract, then then every party to the contract, uh, they have to have some skin in the game, right? They have to give and receive consideration, and as a result, they all have rights. They all have obligations. They have that. They all have interests in the contract uh, that can be enforced. Um, and so, of course, those parties to a contract, the, the actual parties, the, the people who contracted, um, the, the people who negotiated the contract uh, and who entered into the contract, who, who had the, the agreement, right, they can always go to court to try to enforce the contract. Um, but what about other people? What, what about outsiders to the contract who might be affected? Um, what about people who, who maybe weren't uh, uh, parties to the original negotiations? Maybe they're not parties to the contract at all. Uh, that they don't have any obligations themselves, uh, but they may have some kind of right or they may have some kind of interest related to that contract. Um, well, what rights do they have uh, or what obligations do they have? Um, well, these, these, these third parties, the, the parties that aren't actual parties to the agreement, uh, but, but are connected to the, to the contract and so, so may have obligations or may have uh, uh, rights under a contract uh, occur in, in primarily three different ways, and we're going to talk about each one of those. Uh, number one, we're going to talk about agents, uh, agents of a contracting party, somebody who was working on behalf of one of the contracting parties. Uh, do they have any rights? Do they have any obligations? Uh, we'll talk about those. Uh, second is third-party beneficiaries. These are people who, who aren't parties to the contract, but are receiving some kind of benefit or are expected uh, maybe to receive some kind of benefit from the contract. Um, they don't usually have any obligations, but do they have any rights that they can afford, enforce? And yeah, we'll talk about those too. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about well, what, what happens after the fact. What if what if one of the parties or more of the parties to a contract um, decides that they want to transfer their rights or transfer their obligations? Uh, we would call that either uh, an assignment or a delegation. Can, can they give their benefit of the contract to someone else, or, or can they give their obligation uh, under the contract to somebody else? Um, and so we'll talk about that as well, okay? Um, but let's start um, start about talking about, about who the parties are. Let's make sure that we can identify who the parties are before we ta start talking about who the, the non-parties, the third parties might be. Um, so uh, let's begin by, by identifying to, to be a party to a contract, right? Uh, the first thing you have to have is, is capacity, it is recognized legal capacity or recognized legal authority to enter into a contract, okay? Um, individuals, individual human beings um, always have capacity to enter into a contract, right? So uh, I am a real living person. I can enter into a contract. I am a person. You are a real living person. Uh, you can enter into a contract. So so individuals can always be parties. Um, put an asterisk next to that, right? We talked about capacity uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we talked about things like uh, people who may be uh, in, incapacitated or incompetent. Uh, we talked about minors. Do they do they have the authority to enter into a contract? Now remember, for both of those categories, um, that may make a contract um, void a bull, but not void from the beginning, right? So So yes, uh, even a, um, a six-year-old might enter into a contract that might be enforceable if that six-year-old or that six-year-old's representatives um, decide to try to enforce the contract. So, so individuals can always be parties to a contract. All right, uh, next category, uh, sole proprietorships. Uh, I don't know if any of you have taken business organizations yet, 
Uh, but a sole proprietorship, what is that? Uh, a sole proprietorship is just where, where a, a one owner business um, that hasn't done anything else to legally establish some kind of separate corporate identity, right? They haven't incorporated, they haven't set up an LLC, um, they've just gone out and hung out their shingle and decided to open a business. Um, there, there are no formal organizational requirements for a sole proprietorship. In fact, if you don't, if you start a business and you don't do anything else, then the default is going to be that you are a, a sole proprietorship. Um, Sole proprietorships can do business under their own name, right? Like I can be T. Jeremy Watson, and then I can go out and practice law as T. Jeremy Watson, then I'm just a sole proprietorship. Um, sole proprietorships can use assumed names, right? They uh, typically, you know, you register an assumed name, uh, but you don't have to. Uh, the only uh, downside if you don't register it is that somebody else may take it. Uh, but you can register an assumed name. I might be T. Jeremy Watson. Um, doing business as, you know, big boys lawn service. Um, if I don't do anything to incorporate, if I don't do anything to, to establish an LLC or something like that, then even if I register that assumed name, I am just a sole proprietorship, okay? Uh, so, for instance, the, the law office of T. Jeremy Watson, that, that could be a sole proprietorship. Um, um, and excuse me, there's a typo right here on our, uh, right here on my PowerPoint. A sole proprietorship actually absolutely can be a party to a contract, um, but you need to understand uh, what that means. Um, a sole proprietorship is really just the owner doing business under another name, okay? So if a contract purports to have a sole proprietorship as one of the parties, um, well, then it's really the owner who is doing business, okay? So if I'm just doing business, if I'm just a sole proprietorship doing business as big boys lawn service, um, and I sign a contract to, to you know, buy a new lawnmower, right? Uh, something like that. And and big boys lawn service doesn't pay up and, and the, the Home Depot has to sue me to get their money for the, for the lawnmower. Um, they don't have to sue big boys lawn service. They can, uh, but really they're just suing me individually because because under a sole proprietorship, the, the proprietor, the person who owns the business and the business are really one and the same. Okay, so all of the contractual rights, all of the obligations of a sole proprietorship belong to the owner personally. Um, and so if you're going to sue a sole proprietorship, usually you just sue the owner, right? And a sole, but a sole proprietorship, whether in their own name or whether in the, an assumed name, they absolutely can be, regardless of this typo here on that third bullet point, um, they absolutely can be a party to a contract. It's just that the actual party is the owner of the sole proprietorship. Okay, that's pretty simple. Um, the, the next version uh, of, of an entity that could be a party to a contract is a partnership. Okay. Um, uh, again, remember that in order to, to be a party uh, to a contract, you have to either be a real person or you have to be a legally recognized entity. And the law recognizes partnerships as a legally recognized entity. So what is a partnership? Uh, if you haven't had uh, a business org yet, a partnership is, is kind of like a sole proprietorship. A partnership is something where you, you're doing business, but you haven't taken any formal steps uh, with the state, at least, to incorporate your business. You, you might have a, a partnership agreement uh, between the partners, uh, but unless you've done something with the state, uh, to, to register that company as a corporation or an LLC or an LP or something like that, uh, then you're just a partnership, just a partnership. And so what is a partnership? Uh, a partnership is just two or more people um, who have gotten together to do business. Um, um, a partnership is a recognized legal entity. It, it, a partnership can enter into contracts. They can sue and be sued. Um, and many, many businesses do business as a partnership. But again, there's no formal requirements to set one up. And as a result, who is liable on a contract uh, signed by a partnership? Well, generally, just like a sole proprietorship, if you don't take any steps to, to incorporate with the, with the state, if you don't take any steps to, to formally recognize that separate identity, right, then a sole proprietor is really just doing business as himself. Same thing for a partnership, okay? Uh, because you haven't taken any formal steps with the state to set up a separate 
identity, a separate corporate identity, a separate uh, limited liability company identity, a separate limited partnership identity. If you haven't done any of that, um, then the, the partners can be using another name, um, but really they're just doing business as themselves. Um, so with a, a sole proprietorship, if you have a contract with a sole proprietorship, it's important to know who has those rights and also who has those obligations. And it's just the owner, right? Well, the same thing with a partnership. Um, it's just the owners, the partners that have uh, those rights. It's also those partners that have those obligations. So if you enter into a contract with a partnership um, and the partnership um, uh, defaults or, or, or breaches that contract, uh, then you can sue the partnership, but you could also sue each of the partners individually. Um, that means you don't have to sue each of the, every one of the partners. You can just sue one. You don't even have to sue the business. You can just sue the one partner with the with the deepest pockets, right? With the most assets, and that's the risk you take when you enter into a partnership. Now, uh, we should mention here that. Um, uh, in a sole proprietorship, right, the, the person who has authority to act on behalf of the uh, sole proprietorship is usually the owner, right? Well, in a partnership, uh, the owners have the right to act on behalf of the partnership, right? The, the, the owners, the partners, um, are, are, are traditionally regarded as agents. In other words, all partners are regarded as agents for the partnership. Uh, and you need to be really careful if you enter into a partnership uh, that you understand what that means. Or if you're dealing with a partnership, it's important to understand what that means. And what it means is that that one single partner uh, can enter into an obligation on behalf of the entire partnership. They have the authority. They have the right to do that. Now, their partnership agreement may say something differently. Um, and if that's the case and, and, and one partner does something that violates the agreement between them, then the other partner could sue them. But a, a, part, a party who contracts with a partner, unless they have reason to know that, unless they have specific information, unless they have specific notice that this partner is not authorized to do this, uh, then generally speaking, a partner has authority to act on behalf of the business, to bind the business, and to obligate the entire business. And what does that mean? That means obligate all of his partners, okay? So if you enter into just a partnership, um, if you don't do, you don't take any steps to, to, to formally recognize a separate legal entity, like a corporation or an LLC, then you are just a partnership. And that means that one of your partners, if they go out and enter into a contract, even if you didn't want to, even if you think that's crazy, um, if one of your partners goes out and on behalf of the partnership borrows a million dollars so they can go bet it on red in Vegas uh, in the name of the partnership, then you may be on the hook as a partner for, uh, for that million bucks. You're on the hook. E each partner is personally liable for everything uh, that a partnership does, all right? Because there's no because there's no formal legal entity, right? The partnership is is really just a name that the partners are using to do business. And the partnership agreement may control that relationship between the partners, but as far as the rest of the world is concerned, you guys are just doing business together um, and uh, you are both or, or three or four or 10, all partners are personally liable for partnership obligations. All partners are, are agents of the partnership. And we'll talk in a minute about it. Uh, we'll go into, into a lot more depth in a minute about what agency is and what agents are, okay? Um, all right, but so far that means we've got individuals can enter into contracts. Uh, sole proprietorships can enter into contracts, but really that's just entering into a contract with the individual that is the owner, right? Uh, and now we have partnerships can enter into contracts, but a partnership is really just a, a group of individuals that can enter into a contract, right? Um, the next uh, version start to get a little more complicated, right? Um, um, limited partnerships, right? A limited partnership is different uh, from just a regular partnership. A limited partnership is, is a statutorily recognized separate legal entity, okay? Um, it requires formal papers uh, to be filed with the Secretary of State's office, it requires uh, yearly reportings. Um, it requires the, 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 that both the state and uh, the owners of the limited partnership treat it as a legally separate entity. Okay, that means that the, par the, 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 the partners to a limited partnership can't just be writing checks to themselves or for their own expenses out of the limited partnership funds. They need to treat it like a separate entity. Uh, it means they have to file things with Secretary of State. They have to recognize 
um, that it is a separate legal entity. If they don't respect the separate legal entity, uh, then the law won't either. Uh, but if you if you officially set up a limited partnership, uh, then what does a limited partnership look like? Well, typically a limited partnership has um, at least one limited partner. Uh, I'm sorry, at least one general partner. Now you can have more than one, but but most limited partnerships have one general partner, and then one or more limited partners. Okay, what is the difference between a limited partner and a general partner? Well. The, the limited partners are, are, are pretty much just like investors, right? They are passive investors. Uh, limited partners are not agents of the limited partnership. They have no right to make decisions for the partnership. They have no right to bind the partnership to a contract. Um, they have no right to do anything on behalf of the partnership, at least not as limited partners. Okay, now if the limited partnership hires them as an employee, well, then they may have the authority to do things as an employee, but they do not have any rights uh, to control the limited partnership merely because they are limited partners. As a result, uh, they have no liability for limited partnership debts, uh, except to the extent that they've already invested in the company, right? They could, they could lose their investment in the company if the company goes bankrupt. If somebody gets a you know, million dollar judgment against the limited partnership and takes all of the limited partnership's assets, well, then the limited partners may lose those interests, but they're not they're not uh, responsible any further than, than for what they've already contributed to the limited partnership. All right. Uh, the general partner is an entirely different animal, right? The, the general partner is the one who is generally liable uh, for the for the limited partnerships debts. OK, uh, get the difference. A limited partnership uh, partner, uh, their liability is limited to their investment. A general partner is generally liable for all debts of the limited partnership, okay? So in other words, if, um, uh, well, first of all, a limited partnership is a legally recognized entity that, that can enter into a contract. And if a limited partnership breaches the contract, well, then the the, the aggrieved party would have to sue the, the limited partnership first. But if the limited partnership doesn't have sufficient assets to satisfy the debt, then the general partner is generally responsible for all of those uh, excess liabilities, okay? Uh, so why in the world would you want to be a general partner? Well, because the general partner is the one who is running the business, right? The general partner is the one who has authority uh, to do everything. They have the authority to make the business decisions. They have the authority to enter into uh, contracts. Uh, they have a, a, the authority to bind the company to obligations, okay? So the general partner is usually the one who is running the business uh, and therefore has all of the attendant liabilities with that, but also all the authority with that. The limited partners, uh, they're, 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 they're mostly passive investors, right? Their, their only liability is what they've already contributed uh, to the limited partnership. That's the most that they can lose. Um, as a result, they also have uh, no real authority, okay? And we're going to start to see that with with responsibility, I'm sorry, with, with, with authority comes responsibility. The, the more authority you have on behalf of an entity, then the more likely it is that you're going to have liability on behalf of the entity, all right? Now, it's important to understand that people who set up limited partnerships often set up uh, yet another type of corporate entity to be that limited partner, um, who's going to raise their hand and say, hey, I, I want to be the one guy who's responsible for all of our debts, right? Um, so often a limited partnership, um, the general partner will be a corporation or something like that, okay? But, but a limited partnership has to have at least one general partner. Usually they only have one. And then one or more limited partners. Those are the people that are just those passive investors, okay? But um, if you're going to enter into a contract with a limited partnership, then you enter into a contract with the limited partnership. That's who has the rights. That's who has the responsibilities. That's who has the obligations. If a limited partnership breaches a contract, then you sue the limited partnership. If you breach a contract with the limited partnership, then it's the limited partnership that has to sue you. They're the ones that have the rights, not the general partner, not the limited partners, the limited partnership itself, because the limited partnership is a legally recognized entity that has been set up with the state as a completely separate identity. Okay, so that's limited partnerships. Um, and, and then the, 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 I guess the next one, probably the last one we'll talk about are corporations, right? Corporation is going, is going all the way, right? With a corporation, um, the investors or the shareholders are the people who own the corporation, all right? But the investors and the shareholders, 
have no control over the day-to-day -day operations of, of the company. Uh, of the corporation. The shareholders uh, are not agents. They have no right to enter into a contract with the for the corporation. Um, unless, again, I mean, if they were perhaps uh, hired as employees, then they might. But then their right wouldn't be as an investor. It would be as an employee. Right? So, so investors have no right to act on behalf of the corporation. They have no right to, to make decisions about day-to-day -day operations. Uh, they have no right to enter into contracts with the corporation. And as a result, uh, they have no liability to the corporation, except they could lose what they've already invested. They're just investors. All right. Um, and, um, and going even beyond a limited partnership, um, a, a corporation is ultimately the only one responsible for a corporation's debts. Okay. So if you, um, if you have a contract with a corporation, it doesn't really matter who the shareholders are. If you have a contract with a corporation, the only party you're going to be able to sue, the only party you're going to get to go after uh, to satisfy a debt is the corporation itself. If the corporation doesn't have sufficient assets to cover uh, to cover the judgment, then you're just out of luck. Okay. So, um, so if you're contracting again, if you're contracting with a sole proprietorship. You want to know what kind of assets does the sole proprietorship have, but you also want to know what kind of assets does the owner have, because you can go after those two if you have to sue them, right? Um, with a partnership, uh, you can. It's important to know what kind of assets the partnership has, but it's also good to know what kind of assets the partners have, because uh, you can sue them too, right? With a limited partnership. Um, you know, you want to know what kind of assets the limited partnership has, because that's who you're going to have to sue first. Uh, but if the limited partnership doesn't have sufficient assets, uh, then it doesn't matter what the limited partners have, but you may be able to go after that general partner, right? It's important to know what kind of assets the general partner has, uh, because if the limited partnership itself can't satisfy the debt, uh, then the general partner is responsible for the debt. So their assets matter. Um, when it comes to a, co a corporation, though, it only matters what does the corporation have. It doesn't matter who the shareholders are because the shareholders do not run the business. Well, who does run the business? Well, those are usually the officers and directors. And that's where the shareholders have any kind of authority at all. Uh, the shareholders, the, the, the one bit of authority they have is they get to elect a board of directors. They get to elect the, um, the, the um, they get to elect the board of directors to run the company. Okay, and the board of directors then typically hires the officers. Uh, they hire the the president and the CEO and the vice president and the chief financial officer, all those kind of things, right? And then those officers run the company. But it's important to understand the board of directors, uh, the officers, they're just employees of the company. They have no direct liability for things the company does. So um, if you have a contract with American Airlines and American Airlines breaches the contract. Uh, you can sue American Airlines, but that's it. You can't sue the board of directors. You can't sue the officers. They they weren't acting on their own behalf. They were acting on behalf of the company um, when and, and if they contracted with you, right? And you certainly can't sue the shareholders uh, because the shareholders' only liability is to the extent that they've already invested in the company, right? If you get a if you get a big fat judgment and you bankrupt American Airlines, then the shareholders in American Airlines may lose their investment, but that's all they can lose. Okay, the officers and directors, they're not going to lose anything unless they have shares in the company. But, but as, as officers and directors, they're not going to lose anything because they are, only, um, they are only agents of the company. When they do things on the company's behalf, it's on the company's behalf. And everybody knows it because they understand the nature of corporations. So if the president of a corporation signs a contract on behalf of American Airlines, then you know you're signing a contract with American Airlines, not with the president, right? He's not saying, hey, and I'm going to be responsible for it too. No, he's signing on behalf of American Airlines. Um, and so if you sue American, uh, that's all you can sue. You can't sue their president. You can't sue their vice president. Um, it is important to understand that the officers and directors are the agents of the company. They are the ones who, who have the authority to go out and enter into contracts and bind the company. They are the ones that have the rights to make decisions about bringing suit uh, if you breach a contract with the company. Um, but they are acting as agents, and we're going to talk about agents in a minute. Um, they're, they're not doing it on their own behalf, and so they do not incur any kind of liability. All right? So... Uh, so the, the, this final one is a corporation. A corporation is, is a completely separate identity. 
uh, the owners have absolutely no control, and as a result, they have no liability, or, or their only control is they get to to uh, um, they get to vote for a board of directors, and as a result, their only liability is they could lose their investment, right? Uh, but otherwise, the corporation is the party that would enter into a contract because it's it's a legally recognized entity. Um, a corporation has a right to enter into a contract, and a corporation can be sued for breach of a contract, uh, but only a corporation. Okay. Um, there are a number of other entities you might come across, like uh, limited liability companies. Uh, there are some hybrids, uh, professional limited liability companies, uh, professional limited partnerships, those kind of things. Um, and and these are all uh, for for various reasons. Usually they're usually they're related to tax purposes uh, as well as liability purposes. Um, but they're usually a little bit different uh, than an LP, right? An LP has limited partners. An LLC is a limited liability company. Um, it doesn't have partners, but it has. Um, uh, it typically has members, um, and uh, again, it requires formal organization. Uh, it has members who are investors of the company, but unlike uh, um, uh, unlike an LP, um, they are um, they're not passive. They uh, the 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 um, the members in an LLC have the right to kind of run the business. Um, um, the organization of an LLC can be fairly flexible. Um, and generally, if you, um, uh, um, uh, an LLC is just kind of like a corporation where the shareholders are also engaged in running the business, okay? So um, it has a similar, um, a similar structure. An LLC can enter into a contract. An LLC can sue and be sued. Uh, but typically, if you sue an LLC, um, then uh, you can only, if you enter into a contract with an LLC, you can only sue the LLC. The fact that the uh, um, that the investors work there um, doesn't mean that you can sue them. Um, it means that if you entered into a contract with an LLC, then you knew you were entering into a contract with an LLC. You knew that you were not entering into a contract with the owners. And so the only party that you can sue is an LLC. Uh, why would you set up an LLC instead of a corporation? Um, or, or why would you set up a corporation instead of an LLC? Um, well, it really primarily has to do with with, um, uh, with tax benefits um, and and those kind of things. And and you know, a smaller company where the investors actually are involved and in where you know most or many of the investors are involved in the day to day operations, they want to work for the company. Uh, well, then an LLC structure. Uh, may be more conducive to that. Whereas if you have a big corporation like American Airlines, where, you know, 1% of their uh, employees own any stock at all, uh, they're more conducive to a, a corporate uh, type structure, okay? Um, again, there's any number of other um, uh, hybrids, uh, like I said, professional limited liability companies, professional limited partnerships, those kind of things. Some states uh, even create some other ones. Uh, but in a nutshell, um, those are the ones you're going to see most often, right? Sole proprietorships, partnerships, limited partnerships, and then corporations and LLCs, okay? And it's important to know when you're entering into a contract with, with someone, uh, whether or with something, whether they have the capacity to enter into a contract, right? Can they even be a party to a contract if they are an individual, a sole proprietorship, a partnership, a limited partnership, a corporation or an LLC, then they do have authority to enter into a contract. But it's important to know when you're entering into a contract with, with, with an entity like that, who ultimately has the liability, right? If somebody comes to you and goes, look, I'm filthy rich, I'm good for this, so enter into a contract with me, but then they want to sign the contract on behalf of an LLC, then you need to be aware of that, right? Because then it doesn't matter how much money that investor has. The only person you're going to be able to sue or the only entity you're going to be able to sue is the LLC, right? Or if um, if Michael Dell comes to you and says, hey, you know, I'm rich. Uh, you should enter into this contract with Dell Computers because I'm loaded. Uh, it's important to know that it doesn't matter how much money Michael Dell has. It only matters how much money Dell Computers has because Dell Computers is a corporation. If you sue Dell Computers, that's all you're going to get, okay? Um, if you um, have to sue John's Lawn Service, um, John breached a contract with you and he's got a sole proprietorship, John's Lawn Service. And when you sue him, he says, hey, buddy, there's no use suing uh, the partner, uh, so and suing this business because this business doesn't have any assets. Well, then, John, it's important to know that, that your own personal assets 
uh, may be liable, okay? Because um, they're going to come after your own personal assets if you're a sole proprietorship, all right? So it's, uh, it's important to understand the kind of entities that have the right to enter into contracts. Um, it's also important to understand um, that, uh, I guess before we move on uh, real quick, it's important to understand that if it's not on this list, if it's not one of those, those hybrids, um, like a professional limited liability company, um, then it may not have the authority to enter into a contract. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, we did not talk about a trust. You, you didn't see a trust mentioned anywhere in this discussion about who could be a party to a contract. Why not? Because a trust is not an individual entity. A trust is not a legally recognized entity. A trust is just a contract between uh, the person who set up the trust and the trustee. Um, so if you enter into a contract with a trust, um, you're only entering into a contract with whoever signed that, whoever signed that document. Um, and if that wasn't the trustee, um, then you know you can't sue the trust. Um, and if it was, um, if it was the trustee, you know, you still don't have a suit against the trust because the trust again is not an entity; it's just an agreement. Um, so, uh, so a trust can't enter into a contract. A trustee can enter into a contract, but not a trust. Um, so, be careful if you're going to sign a contract with, with something like a trust, right, um, or with a trustee that you know what you're doing and that you understand who is going to be responsible. If you have to file a suit. Don't you dare sue a trust because a trust is not liable. A trust is not a, a um, is not a separate entity. It's just a collection of stuff if it's got any stuff. All right. Um, so th 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 those are the parties to contracts generally. Um, the, the people who can be parties to, or the entities that can be parties to a contract. Um, does that mean they are a, a party to a contract? No. Uh, then we have to look at the contract itself. Um, if you want to know if they were a contract to a party, uh, to, to a contract, then we have to look at, well, did this individual or did this entity have something that we call privity, right? How do you determine who is a party to a contract? Privity. Um, to be a, a party to a contract, uh, this individual or this entity must have privity of contract. And, and what is privity of contract? Privity of contract is that direct relationship uh, between two or more contracting parties, right? Where they have been involved in the negotiations. They have entered into some kind of agreement, um, some kind of, kind of obligation with each other, okay? Um, so um, they are the, the, the parties who engaged in the negotiations. They are the parties who entered into the agreements. They are the parties who gave obligations, okay? If, if, you, if you fit into that description, then you have privity of contract. Let me give you an example, and it's an example I'm going to use again later. Um, if I go to a car dealership and I buy a car for my daughter, um, then who has privity of contract? If I enter into a contract, hey, I'm going to, uh, next Friday, I'm going to bring you $10,000 and you're going to have a car to my daughter, who are the parties to the contract? Well, um, the, the car dealership is certainly a party. They have privity of contract, right? They have entered into an obligation. They were part of that negotiation. Uh, they discussed the price with me and they have an obligation to deliver a car. They have privity of contract. They are a party. Um, I have privity of contract. I went down to the car dealership. I entered into the, those negotiations. I entered into an obligation to the car dealership, right? I have to bring the $10,000. I have privity of contract, so I am a party. What does that mean? That means if something goes wrong with this contract, then I can sue on it because I am a party and I have privity of contract. If uh, something goes wrong with the contract, the car dealership can sue me uh, because we're both parties and because they are a part of this contract. Um, but what about my daughter? If I don't pay the money, can the car dealership sue my daughter? The answer is no. She wasn't there. Yes, I entered into a contract for a car for her, but she wasn't there. Uh, she wasn't part of those negotiations. She didn't give any kind of obligation, right? She does not have privity of contract. So again, if I breach the contract with the car dealership, they cannot sue my daughter because she is not a party to the contract. She does not have privity. She didn't give and receive consideration. She wasn't part of the agreement, okay? Uh, the car dealership could only sue me. But 
Um, what if the car dealership breaches the contract? Well, if the car dealership breaches the contract, they don't deliver the car to my daughter, then I can definitely sue the car dealership because I am a party. I have a right to sue. As a party, I can be sued under a contract. I also have a right to sue under a contract. Um, and so I can sue the car dealership. Um, but what if I don't? What if I decide not to? What if it's just not worth my time? Uh, can my daughter sue on the contract? And the answer is, well, she does not have privity of contract, so she can't sue as a party, but she may still have some rights, okay? Uh, we'll talk about those in just a minute as a third party beneficiary, but she's not a party to the contract because she does not have privity, all right? Uh, before we get to that though, let's talk about agency. What is an agent? Uh, an agent is someone who, who has authority to act on behalf of another person, okay? Um, an agent's authority uh, comes from a principle. So if you have an agency relationship, there's always two parties. There's the agent, the person who has the right to act, and there's the principle, the person who has given them the authority or, or the person on whose behalf the agent is, 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 is engaging in business or, or acting, okay? So with an agency relationship, you always have an agent and a principal, okay? Um, the um, agent's authority only comes from the consent of the principal, okay? Um, you can't just take authority. You can't go out there and just start uh, going around town and entering into contracts on behalf of American Airlines because you don't work for American Airlines and American Airlines has not given you the authority to work on their behalf, all right? Um, what about American Airlines employees? Well, it is still a matter of consent, okay? Um, if American Airlines uh, uh, president or CEO goes and signs a contract with ExxonMobil for uh, you know, fuel, um, they have the authority from the company. The, the company has consented to give them that kind of authority, right? The, the, pre the, the, the president, the CEO, they have the authority to do that kind of business. Um, what about um, a gate agent? You know, what about uh, um, a baggage claim handler for American Airlines? Do they have the authority to go out and, I mean, they're, they're an employee of American, right? So do they have the same authority? Can they go out to ExxonMobil and enter, enter into a contract for gas? No. No, because even though they're an employee of American Airlines, American Airlines hasn't consented to give them that authority, right? Um, and then if you go out and try to enter into a contract on behalf of American Airlines, you certainly don't have authority because you're not even an employee, right? Um, you can't just take or create agency. Uh, that agency authority has to come from the consent of the principal, all right? Where does that consent come from? Well, um, kind of like any contract, a, uh, the, the consent of a principal uh, can generally be either oral or written, okay? It can be oral or written. Um, in fact, much like a contract, uh, the authority of an agent can also be expressed or implied, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you can create authority on your own, but if the, a if the principal himself has done something which would create an impression in somebody else that, that you have authority to, 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 to act on their behalf, then that may create that, that consent um, by an implied grant of authority, okay? Um, does um, does, uh, does uh, uh, consent, does that authority ever have to be in writing? Um, sure, sometimes it has to be in writing. Um, and it's, if it's in writing, we would call that a power of attorney, okay? Um, an attorney is just an agent. An attorney is just someone who has the authority to act on behalf of another person. Um, any one of you could be an attorney today. Uh, any one of you could be granted someone's power of attorney. Um, and you say, well, okay, then why am I doing this? Uh, why, why am I in this course? Why don't I just go start representing people uh, in court? And that's because uh, while you can be an attorney, you can't be an attorney at law. Okay, there's a, a special requirements to represent somebody in a courtroom or to give legal advice. That's an attorney at law. That's the difference between an attorney, which, which just comes from a power of attorney, or an attorney at law, that specific type of attorney relationship where you can uh, represent somebody in court. Okay, that's the difference between an attorney and a lawyer, right? An attorney is just somebody who represents someone. A lawyer is an attorney at law, somebody who is licensed 
to represent somebody in court or in legal matters. All right. Um, but um, so so when does that power of attorney or when does that grant of authority have to be in writing? Um, and when can it be oral? Uh, well, we look at something that we call the equal dignity rule, the equal dignity rule. And that tells us when does this grant of authority have to be in writing in order to be enforceable? Um, remember last week when we talked about the statute of frauds, there are certain types of contracts that must be in writing in order to be enforceable. Well, that's where the equal dignity rule comes in. If the agent is going to enter into a contract that would be required to be in writing, then his authority or her authority has to be in writing. Okay, so if the if the agent wants to enter into a contract that's covered by the statute of frauds, then the contract has to be in writing. As a result, the agent's authority has to be in writing. Um, if the agent is going to enter into a contract that falls without that, that falls outside the statute of frauds, where a writing is not required, if a writing is not required by the statute of frauds or by any other rules, uh, then the agent's authority doesn't have to be in writing either. Okay. So um, if uh, if any of you are married and you're you were going to go buy a house, uh, but you can't go to closing, right? And so you're going to send your husband or your wife down to closing to sign everything on your behalf. Uh, that's fine, but the title company is going to want a power of attorney, something showing that your husband or wife has the authority to act on your behalf. And because buying a house is real estate, right? That fell under L. Remember my legs, that mnemonic device, L stood for land. Uh, contracts that transferred interest in land have to be in writing. And so if, you're, if your husband or wife is going to go down to the title company and sign the documents for you, then that title company is going to need a written power of attorney where you authorize uh, your husband or wife to do that for you because of the equal dignity rule. Okay. Um, there are some other statutes that may require um, grants of authority in other circumstances to be in writing as well, even if it goes beyond the statute of frauds, right? There, there are other statutes besides the statute of frauds that could require either a contract to be in writing or that could require a grant of, of agency, a grant of um, authority to be in writing as well. Uh, one good example of that is a, a durable power of attorney. Um, in Texas, some other states, we might call that a statutory power of attorney because we have a statute on it or a statutory durable power of attorney, um, if you want to put it all together. Um, those statutes uh, typically require that that agency relationship be in writing. Um, so it's important for you to understand uh, what is a power of attorney versus a durable power of attorney or what is a power of attorney versus a statutory power of attorney? Well, uh, again, statutory power of attorney or durable power of attorney, that's the same thing. Um, a power of attorney is just the granting uh, to someone of authority to act on your behalf. Um, uh, it's important to understand that, uh, again, um, <clears throat> a, a power of attorney can be established by express authority or by implied authority. Um, it can be even uh, be established in some situations by operation of law. Um, but... Um, that power of attorney can also be revoked at any time. Um, okay, so uh, great. Power of attorney can be given any time. It can be revoked any time. Um, but then that creates an interesting situation when it comes to things like estate planning, right? Uh, these days, you know, modern science is amazing. We all hope to be 200 years old. Uh, we hope to live uh, so long that we're just mad as a march hare and can't understand anything or do anything on our own behalf. Um, and in that situation, we might need somebody to, to, to do business on our behalf, right? And so we might want to grant them our power of attorney. Um, but the law looks at that and says, okay, now wait a minute. Um, but if you're incompetent and you grant somebody your power of attorney, you won't be able to revoke it. You know, you won't have the capacity to revoke a power of attorney. And the law says you can revoke a power of attorney at any time. So what do we do? What do we do there? And the law resolves that conflict with this rule. And it's very important for you to know. The moment the principal loses capacity, the moment the principal no longer has capacity, then a power of attorney is automatically revoked, okay? The moment the principal loses capacity, a normal power of attorney is automatically revoked. So people come to me all the time and they say, hey, my grandma um, has uh, Alzheimer's, uh, but that's okay because my name is on her, uh, my, my name is on her bank account. Well, if the bank finds out she's incapacitated, then when, you're, when your grandmother put you on her bank account, what she was doing was granting you her power of attorney. And you better look at that, uh, that agreement 
uh, because the moment your grandmother becomes incapacitated, if the bank finds out, they should probably revoke that power of attorney because you no longer you no longer have that authority. All right. So, but then, then what do we do? So how do we plan for these situations in the future? Like, you know, if we get Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. And the answer is durable power of attorney, statutory power of attorney. That's where that comes in. And a statutory or durable power of attorney is a special power of attorney that is authorized by statute that allows that, that power of attorney to survive the principal's incapacity. OK, it says, hey, if I become incapacitated, then this person still has the authority to act on my behalf. <clears throat> that uh, a durable power of attorney generally lists the specific areas where they have the authority to act on your behalf. In fact, every power of attorney is limited only to the authority given. Um, so even if this is a regular power of attorney, if I gave my wife a power of attorney to go close a title company on a house we bought, then that's the only thing I've given her authority to do. She can't then go buy a car in my name as well because my grant of authority didn't go that far. Same thing with a durable power of attorney. In a durable power of attorney, uh, typically you're planning that ahead of time and you want to be real careful. You want to look at the types of uh, authorities that you give uh, to the person who's going to hold this durable power of attorney. But if you follow the statute and if you do it correctly, then that durable power of attorney will survive your incapacity. That's why we call it durable because it lasts past your incapacity. Um, and that's why we use it as a planning document, right? We, we, we use that to plan ahead. Um, and so it serves a good purpose, but because it's special, because it's got that extra authority, um, it must be in writing, okay? It must be in writing, typically uh, follow your statutes, typically it has to be in writing, it has to be notarized. Um, uh, so that goes beyond that equal dignity rule. There's other statutes that can require that power of attorney relationship to be in writing. Um, maybe lastly on that line, understand that death is the ultimate incapacity, okay? So if, if someone dies, not only is a regular power of attorney revoked, uh, but even a durable power of attorney is revoked. Even a durable power of attorney doesn't survive death. A durable power of attorney only survives incapacity. So if your mom or your dad or your grandmother has a durable power of attorney that they have given you, and you've been taking care of their business, if they pass away, don't go down to the bank and say, hey, my dad died. I want to close out his accounts because I've got this durable power of attorney because that durable power of attorney is not effective anymore. And if you go down to the bank and say, hey, my dad died. I've got this durable power of attorney. I'd like to close out his accounts. They're going to say, okay, um, now what did you say his name was? And what day did you say he passed? And they're going to type on their computer a little bit. And then they're going to say, okay, uh, thank you very much. There's nothing else I can do for you. I've just frozen those accounts. Um, because again, uh, death is the ultimate incapacity. That is, that revokes any power of attorney. It revokes um, uh, any durable power of attorney as well. Okay. If you want to, you want to do business for somebody after their death, then they have to have a will. That's a whole other class. Um, all right. So that's a, a durable power. Of, that's powers of attorney. That's the, the way you grant authority. Um, durable power of attorney. We talked about the equal dignity rule. The types of of powers of attorney that that have to be in writing. Um, Actually, I guess let me back up a little bit here and, and, and hit this last part on the slide. Um, in, in what ways um, can uh, that, besides a written power of attorney, what other ways are there to, to grant agency, to, to grant somebody the authority to, to, to act on your behalf? Um, well, there's always express authority, right? A, a, express authority is where, where you give an agent specific authority by specific words or conduct, okay? Express authority could be in writing, that would be a power of attorney, right? A written express granting of authority would be a power of attorney. Um, but it could also just be verbal. Um, even if it's if it's verbal, it could be expressed, right? Um, um, uh, hey, friend, um, I, I you know here's my credit card. I give you authority to go down and, and buy a new lawn lawnmower for me at Home Depot. Um, that's express authority, even if it's not written. It doesn't have to be written. There's nothing that says uh, you got to have a writing to buy a uh, a lawnmower at Home Depot. Um, uh, Home Depot may not let you use my credit card, uh, but I have given you express authority, okay? There could also be implied authority. Um, it's important to understand that, remember, uh, the authority has to come from the consent of the principal. So it's only the principal's actions that can be used to imply authority, okay? But, but if the authority does something um, to, to give somebody else the, the reasonable impression that they have your authority, then they may. Um, 
if if um, if you have appointed an agent to do something, um, that may come along with the implied authority to do whatever is necessary to carry that out. OK, so like if um, if I sign that written power of attorney so that my wife can go down and and buy a house for, me, for us. Right. Then, of course, she can sign the mortgage documents um, to close on that house because that's what I gave her the express authority to do. Um, but there's other documents that might need to be signed, right? I might need to sign off on a HUD-1 that shows how the money's going to be distributed. Um, I might need to sign off on, um, sign off on a title commitment that says, hey, here's some exceptions to title. You know, there's some easements on that property, those kind of things. Um, and um, uh, um, if that's necessary in order for my wife to be able to close on the house, uh, then her authority to do those things would be implied from the fact that I gave her the authority to do one thing, right? The, 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 all the other things that are necessary to complete that task might also be implied authority. Um, you might see an agency uh, relationship um, as an operation of law, right? Um, some uh, rights uh, and obligations are not, maybe not intentionally created by the parties, uh, but are created automatically by statute, Um we see this especially in like emergency situations, right? Um, if um, uh, if your spouse or your child is is injured and they're unconscious, they can't make the decisions for themselves. There's a statute that says you can authorize treatment on their behalf, um, and if you're authorized to to um, uh, uh, to um, uh, to accept treatment on their behalf or to authorize uh, treatment on their behalf, then you also have the authority to obligate them to pay for it. OK, so if you're um, if your son is an, in an accident and he's yeah you know, he's 21 um, and he's unconscious and the, the statute gives you that and he needs surgery and the statute gives you the authority as his mother or his father to consent as his next of kin. Um, then when he wakes up, the hospital can uh, can uh, sue your son uh, to pay for that surgery. And the son says, well, hey, I was asleep. I didn't I didn't authorize this. Yes. But your mother or your father did. And they were your authorized agents. And the son may say, well, I never gave them authority to, to, to agree to that. No, but the statute did. The statute gave them authority to act on your behalf, to authorize the treatment, um, and as a result, to obligate you to pay for it. Okay, That's another way to establish agency, to establish an authorized agent relationship. Um, let's understand this, uh, this new term, ratification. Ratification is a way to establish an agency relationship. What is ratification? Um, ratification is kind of the, the establishment of that agency relationship after the fact, okay? So this is where somebody goes out and, and, and purportedly does something, right? A, a purported agent goes out and acts on behalf of a purported principal, but they didn't really have authority to do that, okay? And if that's the case, then just stop right there. The, the principal is not obligated under whatever the, the contract was, right? But at the same time, if the principal is not obligated, if that agent didn't have any authority, then the principal also doesn't have any rights. Okay, but what if the what if the principal looks at this contract and says, "Well, you didn't really have authority to do that, but uh, but I appreciate it. I like this. This was a good contract. Um, they want to accept the benefits of that contract. Well, if you accept the benefits, then you have to accept the responsibilities, and we would call that ratification. So if if the principal comes in after the fact and approves or accepts the deal, um, then that would be establishing an agency relationship or, or, or uh, by um, establishing agent authority by ratification, okay? By coming in after the fact and accepting it. Um, uh, there is, uh, we might have an agency relationship, maybe not established, but at least recognized by law under an apparent authority relationship, okay? Where a, a principal's dealings with another third party has created a reasonable belief in that third party that the agent has authority, okay? Um, maybe the agent doesn't really have authority, uh, but the third party doesn't know that. And the principal has done something um, to, to let them believe that that a purported agent does have their authority. Um, what could that look like? Well, we often see this in situations. Remember I said that a, a power of a, that, that an agency relationship or power of attorney can always be revoked? Um, well, we often see this apparent authority where um, where somebody has revoked that relationship, but they haven't told another third party. Okay, so um, 
So maybe I'm a rich real estate investor and I hire you to go around the state and uh, we found out that they're going to build this. They're finally going to build this high speed rail from Dallas to Houston. And I've got a lot of money. So I have appointed you to go out and buy up a bunch of property for me. Um, and you entered into one contract for me and you bought a piece of real estate and uh, they called and said, hey, does this guy have your authority? And I said, yeah, he does. Um, and so they entered into the contract and, and, and you bought it. And then you bought a third piece of property and a fourth piece of property and a fifth piece of property for me. And those were all great. Uh, but then I found out you're dating my sister. And so I fired you. Um, and I told you, you know, I'm revoking your authority. You're done. You're out of here. I don't ever want to see you again. Um, but then uh, you continue. Maybe you had already started negotiations with somebody and you continue those negotiations and you finalize a contract there. Um, and then when those people don't get paid, they sue me and they say, hey, um, this guy, you know, he was your agent and he entered this contract on your behalf. And I say, ha, ha, ha. See, look, here's my piece of paper where I revoked his authority the day before he signed that contract with you. Well, is that fair to the third party? No, the third party is going to say, now, wait a minute. You didn't tell us about that. Um, you led us to believe that he did have your authority. You know, we we contracted him with him multiple times in the past. Um, and you accepted those benefits. Uh, maybe you knew he was negotiating with us this time, and you never told us he wasn't your um, he wasn't your agent anymore. Um, so maybe he didn't have actual authority, uh, but he had apparent authority that the courts may recognize because you led us to believe you gave us a reasonable belief. Your actions, not not the agent's actions, your actions uh, led us to a reasonable belief that he was your agent. Um, let me give you another example. Uh, remember our former President Donald Trump and former Governor Rudy Giuliani. Uh, remember after the 2020 election, uh, Rudy Giuliani was going out and doing all kinds of stuff. Even before the election, during Trump's administration, Giuliani was all over the place. What was his role? Was he an employee of the federal government? No. Um, was he Trump's agent? Well, people kept asking Donald Trump that. And he never really answered, right? He would he would send Rudy Giuliani off to Ukraine uh, to enter into some negotiations. And they would say, who is this guy? And he would say, well, just talk to Rudy. Um, or after the election, Rudy would go and, and file lawsuits and and appear at, 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 um, uh, at, at uh, media events and that kind of stuff and, and make crazy allegations. Um, and people say, who do you represent? He would say, I represent Donald Trump. Well, is that enough to make him Donald Trump's authority? Is that enough to give him apparent authority? No. Rudy Giuliani's actions alone are not enough. They have to be the actions of Donald Trump. Um, but Donald Trump sent him off to Ukraine, said, talk to Rudy. That's Donald Trump's actions. Would that be enough to make him, uh, to give him apparent authority? Sure, probably so, right? And if if um, if Rudy was going around filing lawsuits on behalf on his behalf, and he knew it, and he was accepting the benefits of those things and paying the bills for those things, and when people ask him, "Hey, does Rudy represent you?" He's saying he does, and you say, "Ah, no comment," or you beat around the bush, right? Those are the kinds of things that may lead uh, to to Rudy having apparent authority, to to having the authority to obligate Donald Trump, even if Donald pulls out a document that says, "Look." Here's where I specifically told Rudy he has no authority to act on my behalf. Okay, well, you had that in your safe, but you didn't tell anybody else. And if your actions would lead a reasonable party to believe that he had your authority, then even if he didn't have your actual authority, he may have your apparent authority. Okay. Um, there may even be situations where uh, where somebody doesn't have actual authority, uh, but the the, the principal uh, the, the principal may be a stopped from denying the authority on equitable grounds, okay? Um, this is a situation, uh, that anytime we see things like estoppel, we're talking about equitable remedies, right? And so um, remember our equitable, remember the, the equitable remedies we talked about at the beginning of this course, uh, quantum merit, um, uh, um, promissory estoppel, right? Those are places where maybe you didn't have actual authority, um, but the court is going to find that there's apparent authority, or the court is going to find that you are stopped from denying the authority on equitable grounds. And generally that's gonna be things, you know, fairness. Is there something that you did uh, that led this other party to believe uh, that they had your authority, right? Uh, so um, so you gotta be careful with authority. Um, authority only comes from consent of the principal, uh, but that consent can be applied um, or it can even, um, it can be implied, it can be, uh, come from an operation of law. 
or it can even be be forced on you because even though you you specifically said no, you don't have authority, um, you didn't tell the rest of the world that, and you let somebody believe that they had authority, or you accepted the benefits uh, of what that person did on your behalf. Okay, uh, so that's authority. Uh, we're about an hour in, so how about if I uh, pause this uh, right here, and we begin the um, uh, we begin the second lecture on, on third parties. Uh, after this, we'll get to uh, third party beneficiaries intended. Uh, versus not intended, incidental third-party beneficiaries. Who has rights under a contract? Um, can my daughter sue on that car you know, that I bought at the, at the car dealership? Remember that one? We'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll even get to secured transactions for just a little bit, okay? Uh, so uh, see you in the next lecture. Thanks so much for being here.